From Studio 1A in Tampa, Florida, comes a talk show that really feels your pain and tells you like it is. We love America and all that freedom-loving Americans want to protect. Live from coast to coast and on your radio, it's For the People with Keith Allen. We'll help you survive. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am Keith Allen and proudly welcoming you to For the People for this Wednesday, February the 22nd, 2017. We have a very best of program put up for you, and it's available right now with Stanton Freeman. I want you to sit back and relax. Do you believe in UFOs? Stanton Freeman's going to explain today. Stanton Freeman with his newest book, Fact, Fiction, and Flying Saucers, written with Kathleen Marden. Welcome into For the People, Stanton. Glad to be on again. You're heading out west. Where are you heading? I'm heading to Phoenix, uh, Scottsdale, actually, uh, starting on, uh, well, Tuesday or Wednesday, depending what you're attending. There's the International UFO Congress, the umpteenth. And it's a big conference. Over a thousand people will be there uh, at any one time. Um, and I'll be presenting a new talk there: astronomy and UFOs. Mm. Well, that sounds very I, juicy. Well, I'm. Uh, how shall I put this? I try to give the astronomers a hard time whenever I can because they <laughs> are constantly making silly statements about UFOs, but. They're unqualified to make those statements. They don't know anything about interstellar travel, engineering, if you will. Uh, they don't know anything about UFOs. Just look at their books. They don't reference the large-scale scientific studies. They haven't given much thought to the evidence at all. And you can say and, that yeah, with clarity, uh, and just for our audience that may not exactly know your credentials, I mean, you know something about, uh, let's say, uh, nuclear fusion, Nuclear propulsion? Well, yeah. The, the, I have several things going for me, just the quirk of how life goes on, I guess. I mean, I thought uh, when I got out of college, I, I'd work for one. I got a job with GE on aircraft nuclear propulsion systems. Uh, that was back in 1956. Wow. In 1958, we spent $100 million in that program. We employed 3,500 people, of whom 1,100 were engineers and scientists. So. This wasn't, you know, six professors and 12 grad students. It was a major program. Uh, and I thought I'd spend the rest of my life with uh, GE. My dad worked for the same company for 37 years. What the hell? Why not me? Uh, three years and I was out. And then three years more someplace else. And then three years more someplace else. And, yeah. But what I bring to the table that most people don't, uh, besides being an old guy, <laughs> <laughs> that I've worked on advanced propulsion systems. I worked on fission nuclear rockets, which we successfully tested on the ground. I was involved in a study of fusion for deep space travel. Now, that's very important because almost all the energy in the universe is produced by nuclear fusion in the stars. It's not burning gas up there. The sun is a fusion factory, if you will. And the thing about fusion, not only can you make H-bombs, which from some points of view is a neat thing to be able to do, but you can make propulsion systems. Yeah. Now, let me pause you for a second. Let me pause you, because I know you could you okay. could go for hours just, and it's very fascinating, by the way. Stanton Freeman's our guest, if you're just joining us. Um, just, what, last year, there was this image that scientists were baffled that they saw something flying into the sun. Did you see that report? No, I didn't. It sounds interesting. Did it come out is the important question. <laughs> they saw it come out. They and they believe that they were uh, it was extracting uh something from the corona, you know, for energy. Huh. And of course it didn't melt. I was going to say that's pretty hot territory. <laughs> uh very hot. So it would definitely have to be made uh, that would be some serious heat shields. Well, yeah, and remember, one of my mantras, I have several, is that technological progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. The future is not an extrapolation of the past. Uh, 
you know, uh, you, you don't have to look very far. I used a slide rule when I started working in industry way back in the 50s. Uh, most people have never even heard of slide rules anymore. Yeah, know? what is that? Uh, well, it's a little device that's like a, the size of a ruler. Part of it slides back and forth, and you can do multiplication and division. Oh, yeah, and sure. And things like that. Uh-huh. You know? And everybody used it. Nobel Prize winners, uh, winners used it. Uh, it. It worked. But, you know, I, for three bucks, I can buy a pocket calculator that does far more for far less. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, it, it makes the point that and it's kind of like with weapons. Uh, you, the reason for nuclear is, you know, equals MC squared. Uh, a big bomb in 1944 was a 10 ton blockbuster. It released the energy of 10 tons of dynamite. Wow, chemical energy. Took a big B 29 to carry it. First A-bomb, 1945, released the energy of 16,000 tons of TNT. The first H-bomb fusion device in 1952 released the energy of 10 million tons of TNT. That's My one goodness. stinking bomb. Mm. And then the Russians tested one that was 50 million tons of TNT energy equivalent release. Now, now those are mind-boggling numbers when you stop to think about it. But they also give you an answer to the question, why would anybody out there care about us? They want to quarantine us, I think. I mean, <laughs> you think? Look, look at our track record. Uh, in World War II, we killed fifty million of our own kind. We destroyed, we destroyed seventeen hundred cities. Uh, we have since that time exploded two thousand nuclear weapons. People are surprised at that. They think of a few: Trinity Site, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki. Two thousand. And so, from an alien viewpoint, we're a threat to the neighborhood. And there have been a number of incidents at uh, nuclear facilities, especially I'm thinking of uh, Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana, yeah. where uh, UFO shows up and 10 Minuteman missiles went offline one after the other. Now, that can't happen, but it did. It did. I talked to the guy who was down in, in the pit, so to speak. Uh, so somebody cares. And there's a book by Robert Hastings called Nukes and UFOs. A lot of observations. Fukushima, just recently, a number of years back uh, in Japan. Well, yeah, I don't know if there are any... Did anybody see UFOs? There? Yep, they did. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, you I look into that. Every day. Yeah, uh, that's okay. I, I, fo- I try to follow the stuff, too, because I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious. And But, yeah, that was a big report saying they saw them by, and uh, it said it could have been a whole lot worse, and most people knew it, and it... And people said, well, it was a miracle that uh, didn't well. Uh, many people believe that we uh, had some help. Well, look, it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, I'm not saying these guys are good guys uh, running around the neighborhood trying to help people out. On the other hand, uh, I, they seem to be, uh, what's the word, they'll, they'll take action in self-defense, but they don't seem to be bent on destroying us. Well, they know we got a valuable resource. Could be our resources. Who knows? Well, you know, a lot of people are surprised when I say the Earth is the densest planet in the solar system. What do you mean? Aren't they all a planet's a planet? No. Uh, A cubic foot of Earth weighs more than a cubic foot of any of the other planets. Now, what difference does it make? Hmm. That means more heavy metals. Uh, uranium is one of them, for example. Big one. Uranium and osmium, stuff that uh, protects things that nobody's ever heard of, but they have very special properties. So they could have been mining their resources here for a long time. Yeah. Uh, There's evidence of that, too. There's evidence of that, showing that uh, it it wasn't cavemen that uh, were mining that stuff. Something else was. Well, that's right. We, you know, look how little we know about our past history. I mean, there was Bishop Usher in the 17th century saying that the Earth was created in 4004 B.C., he went through a lot of begats, if you will, and that's what he came <laughs> up with. Well, he left six zeros out of there someplace. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. So it, it, it's, uh, like I say, I'll be focusing on the stupid things that astronomers have said. Uh, and I debate them. I'm Seth, Dr. Seth Shostak and I, as one of the leaders of the SETI movement, debated on a radio program. And... Uh, uh, I got 57% of the vote, he got 33% of the vote, and 10% said, I don't know who won. Uh, so I, I, I'm on a crusade, if you will, 
my basic rule is have facts in hand before putting mouth in gear, and I wish the debunkers would do that. I wish they would, too, because there's too many people that do capitalize off what I call just garbage, and you know who they are. Uh, yes, yes. And our latest book, uh, Fact, Fiction, and Flying Saucers, came out in September, actually. And you can get an autographed copy from me, which you can't get from uh, Amazon. And how do we get the autographed copy from you? Well, they go to my website, uh, www.stantonfriedman.com, and it shows you how to order it. You can use PayPal. makes it easy. to get uh, Now, Friedman, folks, F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N, Stanton Friedman, Freed, F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N, and uh, get your .com. autograph copy. Yeah, and uh, it, I mentioned it only because people say, oh, I can always buy the book at Amazon. Yeah, but you don't get the autograph. No, and that's special. I got nothing against Amazon. They sell a lot of our books. They're terrific. And if you go to my website, you, the, the, that's the sixth book with my name on it. So uh, I don't know if there'll be any more, but who, who can predict? Uh, I have a feeling that there's one in the works that you've been wanting to write. So, you know, hey, I'm, I'm saying get cracking, buddy. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm thinking about it. But this Good. is my third book with Kathleen Marden, uh, who's Betty Hill's niece. Um, What's that story for our audience that may not know the Betty Hill story? Well, Betty and Barney Hill were driving along in New Hampshire way back in 1961. They saw a UFO in the sky and stayed over there and moved around, seemed to follow them a bit. It came very close. Uh, Barney got out of the car and stood there with binoculars looking at this thing. It's a big round craft with double row of windows, and it could see beings behind the window. It got scared. And uh, they took off, and they heard some strange buzzing sounds that seemed to vibrate the whole car and... Uh, they they lost two hours on getting home at their home in New Hampshire. They had some physical problems. Uh, Barney had ulcers, and the doctor said, you know, I think you ought to see a psychiatrist And uh, because his medicine wasn't doing any good, and they did. And under hypnosis, Dr. Benjamin Simon, the world's expert on what t- today we call PTSD, post-traumatic stress. That's right. Yeah, it's a big one. Then... Uh, he, had a, he ran a hospital at 3,000 beds for shell shock, shell shock war veterans, is what they were called at the time. And under hypnosis, uh, separate sessions, uh, amnesia-induced after each session, they revealed that they'd been taken on board that darn craft and treated as specimens, a catch-and-release program. I yeah, <laughs> I guess so. And uh, so... Uh, they didn't want to go public. Betty a social, was a social worker. Barney worked for the post office, very active in civil rights. It was a mixed marriage, which was kind of unusual in New Hampshire for 1961. Oh, yeah. Uh, and the first book came out only be the story got out only because somebody broke a confidence. They heard a little talk that Betty and Barney had given and told a reporter, and he followed up on it, and they thought they were going to lose their jobs. And uh, it turns out uh, they didn't. Uh, the, the story went over very well. The first book, The Interrupted Journey, came out by John Fuller. And then Kathleen Martin, Betty's niece, has spent years going over all Betty's records and stuff. And we put out a book, Captured, the Betty and Barney Hill UFO Experience. Great book. Years ago. Thank you for that book. Well, well, I appreciate that. We enjoyed it. And for people to say, well, I read The Interrupted Journey. Well, this brings it up to date. Yeah. The star map work, for example, is a whole chapter on the star map work. And one of my objections to some of the attacks on UFOs, you'll hear astronomers saying the aliens would have to come from hundreds of light years away. Look how long it would take. Or from another galaxy. And I say, wait a minute. The latest data from the Kepler satellites suggests that there's between 1 and 1.6 planets per star. That means that within a mere 100 light years of us, the galaxy is 100,000 light years across, within a, a mere 100 light years of us, there are 10,000 stars, which suggests at least 10,000 planets within a mere 100 light years. Uh, and, you know, I'm not saying y- you can hop over there, but look, M- Magellan, took, his ship took three years to go around the planet, 1523. Uh Around the world in 80 days was Jules Verne's notion. That was in the 1800s. And the space station does it every 90 minutes. And if you're, spe- if you're traveling at the speed of light, or if you're going through what some 
uh, scientists say that 